All right, let's go ahead and begin. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District September 9 board meeting. I am AESD board president, Paula McAllis, and I call this meeting to order at exactly 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being conducted telephonically by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public Board members and cabinet members will be video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of the meeting. For English, you may co uh, connect by phone as follows by calling 601-908-3251. When asked, please type in the PIN 832-511-434 followed by the pound sign. Spanish interpretation of the board meeting is available to attendees. Para Español puede conectarse Por teléfono de la siguiente manera, llame al 919-636-4343. Cuando se le pida, presione en el pin, el pin 479 symbol pound. Now, board members, tonight all voting will be by roll call vote. When motioning or or seconding an item, please state your name. For any items being discussed, please state your name before discussing the items. Thank you very much. All right, let's go ahead and begin with our flag salute, everyone. Please put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> all right. Moving on to item 3B, introductions and roll call. Let's go ahead and begin with board member Ryan A. Ruelas. Present. Board member Jackie Philbeck. Good evening, everyone. Board member Mark A. Lopez. Present. Our board clerk, Juan G. Alvarez. Present. I'm Paula McCallis, your board president, and I'm present. Our superintendent, Dr. Christopher Downing. Good evening, everyone. Uh, followed by our Assistant Superintendent of Education Services, Dr. Mary Grace. Good evening, and for those of you on YouTube, we're working on the sound. Thank you, Dr. Grace. Uh, followed by our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Dina Mellon. Good evening. Iris Camacho, our Senior Administrative Assistant. Hello, everyone. Followed by Mary Madrigal and Alina Rogue, our interpreters. All right, Mary, are you there? Okay, I see Mary. Welcome, Mary. All right, followed by Janice Cato and Darren Brown, our technology assistants. Hello, good evening. Uh, Darren is not here this evening. All right, welcome Janice. Okay, let's report the closed session actions that were taken. There were none. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to the adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved, Rellis. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Trustee Philbeck. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote, Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Our board clerk Alvarez. Aye. I vote aye. So it passes 5-0. Moving on to special order of business. There is none. Followed by our news and updates. Starting with 5A, our parent leadership group updates. Dr. Mary Grace, our superintendent of Ed Services, will provide us some updates on our parent leadership groups. Thank you. I would uh, actually like to turn it over to one of our parent leaders, Mrs. Maritza Morano. 
She is going to share with you some of the um, amazing activities that our parents have been up to throughout the summer. Um, so go ahead and uh, take it away. Thanks, Maritza. Good evening, everyone. Um, hi, my name is Maritza Murano. Uh, I am a fourth year parent leader. And uh, I am very thankful to be here this afternoon to let you know about the interesting uh, things that we're doing as parent leaders. Um, over the summer, even though it's been looking a little different than other years, we've been able to um, stay active. We, we did a couple of uh, uh, trainings. One was with uh, Latino Health Access. And that's only a two-day training, uh, but it is very, very uh, important. I mean, um, the stuff that we saw there was amazing. It just, it's an eye opener just to see what our communities are are going through, um, to see why, why it's really happening and hitting us so hard the way it is. Um, that's only a two day training, but it was very powerful. Very, I mean, it really impacted me to see, uh, to see what's going on in the communities. I mean. It, it does, it just, it's an eye opener. Um, the other one that we did was with uh, UCI. That one was a little more intense. It took a lot from us. Um, that we had to do about 25 hours uh, of courses online on our own. So being able to navigate <laughs> and kind of, you know, getting into the whole technology uh, deal was a little difficult for us, but I feel that uh, being involved, it, it already kind of gave, gave us a little bit of a head start. So. We didn't struggle that much. I mean, we were able to just um, go and take on, you know, all these uh, courses online. So that was that was a little a little more. It took a lot from us, but uh, overall, I believe we had about uh, over fifty parents involved in both of the both of the trainings. And uh, what we really got out of this was just to be able to understand. Um, how our communities are being impacted, the reasons why uh, they have no access to health. I mean, uh, all, all of us uh, Latinos, uh, mainly Latinos that were impacted and also the African-American uh, community is mainly because uh, they're essential workers. They need to go out there. They need to provide for their families. They need to, you know, they're, they're living in smaller places. So if they don't work, who's going to provide for them? So um, just seeing all that was, it, it impacted me a lot. And I was just very thankful to be able to take those courses uh, and find the time. I mean, they gave us a lot of options on when to take them. So it really, um, it really helped that they were able to accommodate all of us. And it kind of goes back to our, what we've gotten uh, from tra of, of the training from our elementary with our PLI, our PTA groups. I mean, um, not every family needs the same things. Every family is different, just like all of our kids. They're all very different. And so they all need different different things, you know, and, and different necessities. So uh, just to be able to see how it kind of goes hand in hand and all of our families need something different was very, very powerful. I mean, it's it, it all goes hand in hand. Um, something else that we wow. did, we, we've been doing up, uh, since everything is looking so different for us and we're not physically active or not being able to take workshops at the district, we're still very active. We're parents that are, that thanks to all the uh, workshops you've given us and all the uh, all the trainings that we've gotten from the district, uh, it's giving us the power to just go out there and not be afraid, to go out there and really make a statement in our communities, to be those leaders that our communities need. Uh, when it comes to maybe delivering food or um, giving them resources, because resources are there. We just need to be able to, you know, and then also spread them. Um, with that, uh, Latino Health Access now is very uh, in touch with uh, Jesenia, with the district. And so they've been able to share all the Latino Health Access uh, COVID testings. And so those have been going also uh, to the faces and then from there we parent leaders get those resources and we just make sure that we're spreading the word we're letting all the parents know that this is here there's resources you know don't ever feel like you're alone uh and it goes hand in hand with uh, building those great relationships. I know that Ms. Torellas have has been very, very active. Thank you for being so active with us, you know, bringing all your bros and helping us with all the distributions that we've done. Uh, it's it's a little chain. 
I mean, it, we're family. We're, we're, we start with the elementary district, then we go on to the Anaheim district. And then from there, you know, just building those great relationships that we've, we've been able to, uh, to build. So thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to be parent leaders, to really empower us to go out there and not be afraid and, and just advocate for our community, for our kids. A lot of parents have been asking, well, when are we going back? Well, in order for us to go back, we need to make sure that we follow these steps. And so with that, it includes, you know, uh, being involved and educating ourselves and spreading the word, spreading the, the good that's out there. So um, thank you. I'm very, very thankful and honored to be part of this uh, of this uh, Parent Leader Institute and our PTAs and all of our, our, um, our groups that we have at school. Um, and the last slide, uh, you can see some of the parents. I mean, you can see so these parents are parents that maybe started with the Anaheim district, uh, the, the elementary district, and now they've moved on to maybe the Anaheim, Anaheim High School district. And so you can see how they're out there, uh, of course, taking the precautions that are necessary, but they're out there. Mr. Relas is right there. You know, all these moms from from uh, the Anaheim elementary district, district, some of them from the high school. And so, um, Ms. Ms. Maritza Bermudez, who has been very, very involved and has been able to get a lot of resources for our communities. So um, that's what we've been doing. We're, we're very busy. We've, we're very, very busy. And even though it's looking a little different for us, we're busy from home. And whenever it's possible, we're also getting our hands dirty with, you know, distributing produce, milk, whatever we can. So thank you for, for empowering us to do so. Well, thank you so much, Maritza, for all your hard work. Uh, and uh, please thank everyone for me. Uh, and great work. Also, trust you, Ruelas, uh, in collaborating with uh, the bros and uh, all these great parent leaders. Uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Morano. Dr. Paolo Magalas. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, I know this isn't protocol usually, but I do just think that this does deserve basically recognition because of the fact that you all have done so amazing. And um, yes, I've been out there uh, helping out whenever I can be. You know, I'm an East Side guy and a lot of these events take place on the East Side of Anaheim and um, I'm always there for the community. Um, the I, I just wanna give a shout out, you know, to the leaders that we have um, in the Anaheim Elementary School District like Maritza um, and others who have really gone above and beyond. Um, and making those connections and really serving as ambassadors and organizing our community. And, um, you know, that's, you know, those of you that know me well, you know, that's what it's all about for me is community. Um, when it comes to the Anaheim Bros, um, I'm very proud of that organization and the great things they continue to do. Um, the shout out goes to Martin Caldron, who basically, um, you know, is uh, making those connections with Anaheim Elementary School District through the, the right the grants that he has been producing, et cetera, especially for our dual language people. So I'm just really, really proud of everything that you guys are doing um, and the skills that you're acquiring uh, through the Parent Leader in Leadership Institute and really utilizing them in the community. And 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 you can see the the, the fruit of this labor. So kudos to you, Maritza, and everybody else involved in this project. Super proud. Thank you. Thank you. I am honored. I'm honored to be right. part of part of this amazing community. So thank you. Great work, everyone. And uh, anytime, uh, Trustee Ruelas, that was uh, well uh, called for. Uh, moving on to 5B, uh, association updates. There are none for this evening. Uh, and then moving on to 5C, district news and updates. There is also no district news and updates for tonight. Moving on to item six, our public speakers. There's also no public speakers for tonight. So we then move on to item seven, superintendent's report and public hearings. All right. So, and by the way, uh, the presentations will be posted on the district's website uh, on the Board of Education page starting tomorrow. All right. So, um, moving on to seven. Presentation is going to read from agenda. Uh, board president, uh, the next presentation is the unaudited actuals report. Ah, okay. By uh, uh, by Jesse Chavarria, our director of transportation, and Dr. Downing, our superintendent. Board president, be before we begin, um, I know one of our board members uh, lost connection. Ah, okay. Um, so I'm Let's going to ahead. ask for a, a brief uh, recess of two minutes. While okay. we get our while we get the board member reestablished. 
Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Thank you. And welcome, Jesse. Let's just uh, wait a couple minutes uh, for Trustee Philbeck to join us. Okay. Jesse, do you prefer Jesse or Jesus? Because on the agenda it says Jesus. Uh, my legal name is Jesus, but I go mm -hmm. by Jesse. So we're good okay. with Jesse. All right. Dr. McCullis, could you please do a mic check? Testing, one, two, three, test, test, test. This is a mic check. Test, test, test. Thank you. And Board President, I just received an update. We're almost there. Um, thank you for your patience. Of course, and uh, I'm sure a lot of our families out there and. Uh, everyone who's in the workforce or just, I mean, pretty much everyone online is uh, having to go through, you know, technical difficulties and uh, having to be patient at this time. So I guess right now it's a perfect time for everyone just to take a moment and breathe. If you need to take a stretch break, take a stretch break. Members of the community, please be patient. We are having technical difficulties. Thank you for joining in tonight. Hope you're all well. And safe during these difficult times.
Dr. McCullough, would she be able to call in? Yeah, she's calling now. Oh, okay, great. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi. Hello? I apologize. My internet went down and I've been trying to get back in this whole time. It's I okay. apologize. Welcome. It's okay. Welcome back. All right, Jesse, go for it. Um, before Jesse begins, um, if I could, I just want to uh, thank Mr. Chavarria. Um, Mr. Kraus uh, accepted a position a lot closer to his home, and we certainly all support uh, his decision. And Mr. Chavarria agreed to provide this presentation this evening on very short notice. So I'd like to thank you. And now, Jesse, please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Let me uh, set up. Uh to present to you. Okay, um, well, well, good evening, bo uh, Board of Trustees. I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to present to you the unaudited actual report for 2019-20 uh, fiscal year. But before I begin, I do want to acknowledge uh, our Director of Business Services, Priscilla Martinez, as well as our Director of Fiscal Services, Craig McAlpin, and their entire team, everyone working in their departments, because they're the ones who did the hard work in getting the necessary information for this report. So what are the unaudited actuals? Well, the unaudited actuals is a picture of the financial status for the end of this fiscal year. In this case, the 2019-20 uh, fiscal year. In this picture of the financial status of the district highlights how much revenue came in and what were the total expenditures from July 1st of 2019 through uh, June 30th, 2020. In this financial status picture also captures any carryover as well as any other future obligations the district may have. So looking at our revenues for the 2019 unaudited actuals, there are four major sources where we get our revenue from. And those are listed on your left there. And I will go through each one. And just for uh, the sake of not having to read the entire number for you, I'll kind of round to the nearest uh, million. So under LCFF, we had estimated that we would be uh, getting about $189 million. Um, the unaudited actual was actually $189.6 million. This was a change or a difference of about half a million dollars. Under the federal revenue, we estimated that to come in at $14.5 million. 
The actual was a little bit more than that, a change of about $42,000. Under other states, we estimated that revenue to be 23.2 million. The actual amount was 24.9 million, a uh, change there of 1.7 million. And under our local revenue, uh, we estimated that to be about 2.5 million. The actual amount was 2.7 a difference there or a change of 246,000. So our total revenue uh, that we had estimated for the 1920 fiscal year was 229.2 or 0.3 million. The actual amount that came in was 231.8 million, a change of 2.5 million. The graph, this pie chart here, kind of gives you a better glance of where our revenue uh, comes from. Uh, the bulk of that revenue, of course, comes through the LCFF, followed by the other state and the green um, um, piece of the pie, uh, then federal, and then our local revenue as well. So two major changes in our revenue in our report here is first is LCFF. There was a change there about half a million dollars, and that change is due to, re, to reclassifying revenue per Orange County Department of Ed, uh, AB 602, that is um, part of the special education funding. And under other state, there was a change or a difference there, about 1.7 million. And this is mainly due to GASB 68, which is an accounting standard requiring our district to report the net liability for its proportional share of STRS. This revenue uh, is offset by an equal expenditure that, that gets uh, reflected in our expenditure side of, um, of that report as well. So looking at our expenditures for the 2019-20 fiscal year, um, the, the various categories are on your left there. I will go through each of those. Certificated salaries, we estimated that our expenditures there were gonna be 102.8 million. The actual amount was a little bit less than that at 102.7 million, a change of $100,000 roughly. Under classified salaries, we estimated that expenditure at $40 million. The actual amount was 40.2, a change there about 151,000. Under benefits, our estimate was 68.7. The actual amount was 70.2. I changed there at 1.5 million. Under books and supplies, uh, we had an estimated cost of 5.9 million. The actual amount was 5.5. I changed for a difference close to a half a million dollars. Under services, our estimated expenditure was 15.8 million. The actual expenditure was 14.5, um, giving us a change there or a difference of 1.2 million. Our capital outlay was 243,000. Um, the actual, that was the estimate. The actual was 231,000, a difference there of $12,000. And under other outgoing, uh, we had an estimated expenditure of 6.7 million, the actual, um, Expenditure was 6.6, .6, a difference of 100,000. Uh, so looking at all those expenditures, our estimated expenditures for the 1920 fiscal year were at 240.2 million. The actual expenditures for the year were 239.9, giving us a difference or a change of 300,000. So the, the graph here, this pie chart kind of shows to you, highlights where our expenditures are. And of course, the bulk of our expenditures fall um, in, our, in our people. So if we add the certificated, classified, and benefits uh, pieces of the pie, it's roughly about 213 million, which makes up about 89% of our total expenditures. And, and this aligns with the commitment that our board and our superintendent uh, have to invest in our employees because they are the foundation of our success. So some of the major changes to the expenditure as one benefits, there was a change there of 1.5 million. As mentioned earlier in the revenue side, this is due to GASP 68 and we have to offset it here. 
we did the increase in revenue in the revenue section, and here we do the same uh, in terms of the expenditure. Another major change was books and supplies. Uh, there was a difference there or a change of half a million dollars. This was due to COVID-19. Our schools closed back in March and our students began learning uh, remotely or through distance learning. And some of the supplies, some of the things that our schools typically used in March, April, March, um, the, they, they, they did not, we had a realized savings of half a million dollars there. And in terms of services, the same thing due to COVID-19 and our schools being closed and our students learning from home, we had a savings in utilities, sub-agreements, and other services as well. <coughs> and our general fund balance under un unrestricted general fund, we had estimated an ending balance of 28.27 million. The actual ending balance is 31.17. So it's a change in fund balance of 2.9 million. Under the restricted side of our general fund, we had estimated an ending balance of 6.38. The actual ending balance is 6.51, with the difference of uh, being there, a change in fund balance of 0.13 million. So combining both the restricted and unrestricted uh, side of the general fund, we had estimated an ending balance of 34.65 million. The actual um, balance is 37.68, a change in fund balance of 3.03 million. So what are the next steps in regards to uh, the 2019-20 uh, unaudited actuals report? Well, tonight we wanna recommend that the Board of Education take formal action to adopt the unaudited actual report. We will then file financial documents with the Orange County Department of Education and then we will work in collaboration with our external auditors to complete the audit process. And a report of that audit process will be presented to the board at the January meeting in 2021. Once again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to present the 1920 unaudited actuals report and I open it up to any questions you may have. All right, thank you so much, uh, Jesse Chavaria. Board members at this time, do you have any questions for Jesse? Thank you, uh, Jesse. I did hear it on the call. I apologize. I lost, I had to completely unplug and reset my router, I guess, I think, whatever it is. So, but I did hear uh, on the call. And thank you for such a very informative report. You're welcome. All right. Any questions, board members? All right, thank you so much, Jesse. Moving on to 7B, then it is recommended the Board of Education accept and approve the unaudited actuals report for the 2019 2020 fiscal year. Can I get a motion? So moved, Rellis. So Second, moved by Alvarez. Seconded by uh, Trustee Alvarez. Uh, discussion. Great report, Jesse. All thank right, you. I agree. Great report. Uh, so, board roll call vote. Trustee Willis. Aye. Trustee Phil Beck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. Thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Moving on to 7C. 7C. Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan, the LCP Update by Corey Robertson, Director of Digital Education Services, Maria Villegas, Director of Curriculum and Instruction and Early Childhood Education, Leslie uh, Colin, uh, Director of uh, Pupil Services, Yvette Magana, Child Welfare and Attendance Coordinator. <coughs> Board members, as we begin our presentation, I just would like to remind you that we've had a series of presentations around our continuity of learning and attendance plan. And tonight is just a brief uh, overview and a public hearing regarding it. We will bring the final version back to the board on September 23rd. 
With that, I'm going to turn it over first to Dr. Downing. Thank you, Dr. Grace. Um, this evening, board members, we like to start with the most current data for Anaheim and Orange County in reference to COVID-19. It's important to start with the data because the continuity of learning plan is driven by our current need to operate through a distance learning format. I'd like to start with this slide, and I always think this is critical because there, again, is a lot of misinformation that children cannot contract COVID. And this is a breakdown of COVID cases by zip codes here in Anaheim. So if you look on the right, you will see 92801, 92802, 92804, 92805, and 92806. And the number of confirmed cases for children ages zero to 17. You'll also see on the left a total that shows in Anaheim, there are 782 confirmed COVID cases amongst children. Now what's alarming about this data is as of August 31st, our number was 722. So the number has gone up by 60, although our schools have remained closed. When you compare Anaheim to some of our neighboring communities, you'll see a great difference. The only other community that has numbers, and they're actually a little higher, is Santa Ana with over 1,000 confirmed cases. And it's important to note that there is a differentiation. There is a difference for the data in Anaheim and Santa Ana versus all of Orange County. Let's continue, Dr. Grace. This slide is very important, board members, because uh, last week, the uh, California Department of Public Health and the governor shifted from a county monitoring list to a tiered system. And in a moment, we'll look at a slide that will show us the criteria for the tiered system. What this, thank you, Dr. Grace, and then we can go back to the other data. So with the new tiered system, there are four categories. Purple means that there are more than seven daily new cases per 100,000 residents. And a positivity rate when we're testing residents of more than 8%. Now, as of yesterday, Orange County advanced from purple to red. And within red, the criteria are that there are four to seven daily new cases per 100,000 residents and positivity rates between five and 8%. With continued uh, caution and safety, it is the hope that Orange County will advance to moderate which can be defined by one to about 3.9 daily new cases and positivity rates between two and 4.9%. And finally, the yellow stage or minimal, which is less than one daily case per 100,000 residents. Now under this system with purple, businesses as well as schools were to remain closed. Because Orange County advanced to red yesterday, within 14 days, Orange County as a whole has the authority to reopen our schools. However, and we're gonna take a look at the data in Anaheim, it tells a different story. So when we look at the criteria, again, of being in red, where the rest of Orange County is, meaning there are between four and seven daily new cases, you can see that in Anaheim, although the data has improved, there are still over 10 daily new cases. And if you look below, let's look at zip code 92805. We are still averaging approximately 20 new cases. In 92802, 13.5 new cases. And this data is as of September 8th. So you can see that there is a much higher rate within the zip codes of Anaheim, which is the reason we continue to operate under distance learning 
until our data falls to the levels consistent with the rest of Orange County. And I think it's always important for us to revisit this data. It is improving, but there is still such a great difference between Anaheim, Santa Ana, and the rest of Orange County. The conditions, again, for our city and for our zip codes do not find us in the second tier. We still would fall, and that's why we've color coded it in the widespread purple tier because there are more than seven daily new cases. Dr. Grace. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to answer uh, either at the end or now. So board members, are there any uh, questions that I can address about the data before we move on? All right, seeing none, then it is my pleasure to introduce Corey Robertson, and he is going to talk to us about our blended learning. Great, thank you, Dr. Downing. Um, so as Dr. Grace mentioned, we're sharing kind of an overview of the plan. And one of the first things we wanna talk about in addition to the data that Dr. Downing shared is what our blended learning plan um, will entail when our students are able to come back to the school in some capacity. So the blended learning plan um, will consist of both at school and at home work. And we refer to that as synchronous and asynchronous. Um, when this goes into effect, it will uh, apply to 23 of our 24 school sites. Um, the on-site instruction will encompass 40% of the student's week, and then the off-site asynchronous work will encompass 60% of the week. We'll be splitting our students into two groups, a group A and a group B. Group A students will come on-site Mondays and Wednesdays. Group B will come on-site Tuesday and Thursdays. And then on Fridays, we will not have any students on-site. When students are off-site, on any day that they're off-site, whether it's a Monday, Wednesday, or a Friday, they will have asynchronous work assigned to them to work on, and teachers will be able to check in on the work that they're accomplishing. Um, they'll have feedback from their teachers every day, even if they're not physically on-site with their teacher during that day. Um, right now, we're in a distance learning format, so all of the instruction is taking place in our students' um, homes, both synchronous and asynchronous. So in the morning and into the late morning, our students are getting live instruction with the teacher via, via Microsoft Teams. Um, so we have all of our students are in live instruction with our teachers, as well as students are able to break out into smaller groups with the teachers and the other um, intervention TOSAs and support staff that work with our students. And then even though they may not be live with their teacher the entire day as they might be on campus, um, they still have work that they're able to go through in the afternoon and teachers are checking in with the students and the work that they're accomplishing in the afternoon asynchronously. This distance learning format also applies to our Anaheim Elementary Online Academy. But what's unique about that is when we do go back to a blended learning format, the online academy will stay in this distance learning format as that is an option that our families have chosen. Um, regardless of the situation we're currently in, we have families that have indicated that this is a format and, and a structure of education that they feel is best for their child. And so we're gonna be responsive to some of our family's needs and offer this as an opportunity even once we go on to blended learning. So the thing that kind of makes it all work, blended learning and distance learning is the technology piece. And um, as we saw with uh, uh, board member Philbeck earlier, it is not always flawless and it's always uh, um, something that it, it can be completely out of our control and we may feel like we don't have any control over it, but there are things we can do that are best plans. And we do feel that we have the best plan in place for the technology and the connectivity for our families. So what you'll see in this graphic here is the technology that we have that exists in the cloud. And by that, it basically means that whatever happens with our physical network on site, so if there's construction happening on Catella and a, a network is uh, cable is severed and we lose network connectivity to, um, let's say, Ponderosa, um, or power goes down at the district office and we lose network connectivity across the entire district. We're very happy to say that because the majority of our services exist in the cloud, that our students' ability to learn and our teachers' ability to instruct is not at the mercy of what might happen locally with our network connectivity. So if our entire network goes down, our students still have access and our teachers to all of Google Apps, the meet that we're going through right now, 
email, calendar, docs, everything. They also have access to Microsoft Teams. So the live instruction our kids go through every day is not going to suddenly not occur because we lose network connectivity um, at our school sites or at our district office. The staff and student portals that they use to log in and access these resources is also in the cloud. All of our digital curriculum is in the cloud and every program our students have access to is in the cloud. In fact, the only two services that are on our actual network site is ARIES, um, which is our student information system and SMART, which is our data system. So while when the network goes down, it's unfortunate we don't have access to those resources. And of course, we're gonna work as fast as we can to get it up and going. It's really kind of a nice, safe uh, um, feeling to know that while we're doing that, our students are not missing out on instruction because the services they use all exist in the cloud and are completely independent of our network infrastructure at our district office. So connectivity is a big thing. Um, and so we're very, very proud of the connectivity we've been able to provide our families. So we have kind of a before and after sort of graphic here. So um, before the AESD hotspot program that we implemented in the fall of 2019, um, we actually surveyed our families about a year and a half before asking how many of them needed internet um, connection. And we have 14% of our families who responded. We had over 1,800 families respond, state that they were um, did not have internet connectivity. And we're very proud to, to say that as of today, we have provided internet connectivity for more than two times the number of families that indicated a need. In fact, we can confidently say that one in every three families in our district has an AESD hotspot. But we know one in three may not be enough. So in addition to the 4,000 hotspots that we have already disseminated, another 750 just arrived last week and we're processing those and getting those out and going. We've also heard from our families that the connectivity they have via these hotspots may not be meeting their needs. So we've also been working with T-Mobile and by working, I mean emailing them every day and saying, where are we on this? Where are we on this? To upgrade every single hotspot, all 4,750 to an unlimited data plan so that our families don't find themselves in a situation where they may not be able to access something when they need to. And of course, connectivity doesn't mean a lot if you don't have a device. So we're very happy to say that every child in AASD has a device at home. Additionally, should something go wrong with it or it breaks, they can come to our school sites and they don't need to spend time waiting for us to repair it. We swap it out live for them so the family can get on with their lives and the students can continue learning. And then we repair those devices as they come in. And I think that's it for my part. Wow, great presentation, Corey, and great work. Please thank your entire team. You know, I've heard many things from other districts, but, uh, you know, from particularly uh, families who have kids in our district uh, or that teach in others, and uh, they're just super jealous of all the opportunities and uh, that we have here at Anaheim Elementary. All right, board members, at this time, do you have any questions for Corey Robertson? Um, no questions, but just some comments. Um, well, I, I actually, I'm going to, let me, let me back step. I do have a question. What are we at right now in regards to our online academy in regards to uh, student enrollment? Mm. And that could be for Dr. Grace, actually. I think it's around 350. I'll double check. Oh. 350. Yeah, I, I just want to applaud that. And I mean, I, it's pretty amazing that we're able to do that um, and have such a large number. And I've talked to a couple of the, the parents who are participating, whose child is participating in that academy, and um, they're singing it praises. So I, I do applaud that. And I think it's, like I said, 350 is a very, very significant number. And um, I'm super excited about that. Um, but um, I do just want to also say that um, I'm very, very, very proud of this district, and I'm very proud of uh, you, Corey, and, and your team, and everybody that is um, contributing to this transition to distance learning. Um, not even a transition anymore, but full-fledged, you know, interaction on a regular basis now, um, because of the fact that, yes, it's technology, and yes, hiccups occur and whatnot, but it is always easily resolved in Anaheim Elementary School District. And I can tell you this personally, I received a, a call from a parent. I've texted Mary Grace and five minutes later, Mary Grace texts me back. I send it back to the parent and this situation is resolved. So you guys are amazing. Um, and I just, I can't sing you enough praises. You guys are doing a great job right now. 
I also want to echo to add to that sentiment. Um, as a parent myself, there's been a lot of hiccups, but they're not to blame on the school district or any of the efforts on the school district part, right? Everything that has gone wrong has been out of our control and everything that we have control over has been taken care of. I even traded out a laptop even today. Um, just we contact the school, immediately get a new one. It's seamless. Um, we're, we're having issues with connectivity sometimes, but that's just because the networks are malfunctioning themselves. Uh, I'm glad that you, you mentioned the idea of we have everything on the cloud. So from our end, we, we can report, look, everything's fine from our end. And um, I think the more we spread that message to parents about like, you just kind of have to take a deep breath and let things happen. And eventually we can help you troubleshoot and that's what you've been doing. And so thank you for you and your team for, and the district for being so well prepared to handle. This is a massive undertaking, right? There are very few districts that can say they have a device for every child. They have replacement devices for every child that needs a replacement. They have hotspots in excess for every child. Um, uh, everything that we're doing is um, literally amazing, right? So just continue doing the work and we appreciate your, your efforts and making sure things get back up as soon as they can um, and that we're moving on and trying to get as much of our, as many of our kids on and connected as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Alvarez. Uh, I can't see Trustee Phil back. Uh, so Mark, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Corey, for a great presentation. Uh, very thorough and informative. Uh, and you touched on the need that we have for, uh, it's been kind of uh, mentioned a couple of times already, uh, just in the comments about our uh, device need and uh, data need for a lot of our families. Do you anticipate there being any issues with the cost ongoing for data or device distribution, life expectancy, any of that? Um, yeah, with everything with technology, there is some ongoing costs. Uh, we're actually working with T-Mobile about get, uh, with a plan that they have to provide iPads, which is a device that we feel is really well suited for our PK through K students. That comes with a data plan, and we're able to use our distance learning money now to pre-purchase that for a two-year um, opportunity that's done through the state. So where we can, we're trying to um, set ourselves up for success for the next two years or so with the technology that we have. What's really fortunate about our situation and the leadership of cabinet is that we we were a one-to-one -one district before all of this occurred. And we had 4,000 hotspots ready to go for our families before any of this. So in the, in the sense that we haven't had to react to a lot of this, that we already had systems in place that allowed us to kind of deal with this. Um, that's kind of been factored in in terms of the ongoing cost. We have our technology refresh program where we refresh a certain percent of technology every single year because we know that every technology has a certain life expectancy and we've budgeted and planned ahead for that. So we're very fortunate that cabinet has kind of recognized that and has pushed that as a high priority in our district. Thank you. Uh, and Trustee Philbeck, do you have any questions for Corey at this time? Uh, no, I don't. Can you can you see me? I went back out and came back in again. Can you see me now? Yeah. Yeah. I see you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I went out and came back in, and I have no questions except to say thank you, Corey. Um, you amaze me. You really, really do a terrific job, and I just even this little upset tonight with me having to go over there and plug stuff, unplug and reset routers. I'm just like. How do you handle all of these tech problems every day? So just thank you. Thank you. And for your team, for all that you do for us to keep us up and running. Uh, great report. Thank you so much. And Chris, real quick, um, with regards to this presentation, we also have Maria, Yvette, and Leslie presenting. Yes, and they're ready to go. Okay. Can we go? Uh, may I propose, board members, we have the rest present? Uh, and then we hold off for questions until the final three are done. Is that okay? Yes? Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, welcome, Maria. All right. Thank you so much. Um, good evening to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I echo everything that the board said for, for Corey as well, because we can't talk about distance learning uh, for 
for our teachers, for our classified and certificated staff without also knowing that the other half of providing um, connectivity and devices is for the staff. And we have plenty of um, staff here in Anaheim that have needed the same support. So as we looked at providing the distance learning plan, we really wanted to provide a very comprehensive system of support. We knew that we had to include our classified and certificated staff. We needed to have um, on point tools and curricula, and then it needed to be ongoing and differentiated. But just to give you an idea of how much professional development we have provided, we've had over 160 sessions of professional development provided to date. That's just from the end of July through what we have slated through October. So we've been very diligent in wanting to ensure that we meet and support the needs of all because it really is taking all staff classified and certificated to be part of supporting our students and families. Um, in terms of tools and curricula, again, we've we've made sure to provide professional learning around standards aligned curriculum. We've been able to acquire newer curriculums to support um, staff and students in both synchronous and asynchronous learning um, from the learning management systems of Google and you know screen um, um, sorry seesaw to to the actual programs to improve engagement and instruction of um screen classify and so forth so so many so many pieces and then even with assessment how do you assess remotely how do we do that efficiently and effectively how do we um, support teachers in that how do we support families because all of this is really a partnership all along the way so a lot of professional development around that and then finally we really have been trying to be responsive in terms of having ongoing and differentiated we tried to begin the staff development early on um, but yet we have continued it and our, our pds have um, housed anywhere from 50 um, uh, participants through google meets to up to 250 participants so it's just been um, such an effort on behalf of all of ed services from from um, DS to, to CNI to pupil services, it's just been, everyone's been providing these differentiated PDs. And finally, I just wanted to add that the ongoing and the differentiation in the PD has looked differently depending on the need. Sometimes they've been big groups, sometimes they've been trainer of trainers, sometimes they've been one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it just has pivoted as needed to ensure that we're providing staff what they need. So next slide. So in regards to our continuity plan, we have to make sure that we're addressing um, all the unique needs of our of students, whether that be our emergent bilinguals, our you know, SDC students, our uh, highly gifted students, and so forth. We try to ensure that we have, again, highly uh, digital aligned programs that meet the needs of all the programs um, and support the learners in the various programs. Um, some examples include from, again, from our emergent bilinguals, we've, we've integrated a Rosetta Stone program to really support that, again, asynchronous learning time aside from the designated supports during the synchronous time, from our DLI programs to acquire ICE station in the school of the day and other such programs, you know, SDC to unique learning systems, just a various slate of appropriately high quality, high vetted programs. Um, also to support all our students with unique needs. We've also looked at our preschool and I, I don't wanna forget to include our preschool programs and how we've digitized some of the programs for our SCC preschool and state preschool programs. Um, protected learning time, we've been very diligent in providing sample schedules that um, show our need to protect synchronous live instruction. We already know that um, there's limited minutes, limited time with our students. And we want to ensure that as we look at outlining the learning that it it's very um, intentional in protecting live instructional time. Also, um, in terms of small groups, we've been, been very deliberate in ensuring that we're providing uh, one possible small group learning opportunities, both synchronous by the teacher and asynchronous, and during the asynchronous blocks by all support staff, our TOSAs, our instructional assistants, and so forth. Again, um, all hands on deck to support uh, small groups as we know that uh, increases opportunities for learning. And lastly, specialized supports that have been put in, whether it be with resources and or um, um, materials such as headphones and microphones, 
to support our language engagement and assessment. Those are all um, some of the pieces that we've identified to support students with unique needs. Next slide, yeah. So a big piece of our, the continuity um, plan has to be to, to address what, what has been coined as pupil learning loss. We know that the dismissal in some cases uh, may have caused unfinished learning for many of our scholars. And there's some reports that are indicating that it can be up to 30% in literacy and 50% in math. So we have to be very, um, again, deliberate in how we outline our learning plan. Some of the recommendations um, and strategies being recommended by CDE and professional organizations, we've we looked at closely and again we've included them in our plan such as and i have them noted here you know it's important that number one we're including grade level content we can't divert from that we have to stick to the plan of grade level standards and instruction and keep the rigor there for students though we may be concerned let's not um that we don't want to make this challenging for kids really the research is there kids learn when the, the, the content is engaging and rigorous, they rise to the occasion. To the occasion. Number two is focusing on depth and, um, and not um, pacing. That's been very uh, closely outlined with how we've adjusted our pacing calendars, how we've identified our essential standards, and also how we've, um, which is a later uh, bullet there, how we're using assessment. Prior, prioritize content and learning. Again, that goes to our essential standards. We've identified what's most essential, what are those standards that are gonna be enduring and be leveraged across grade levels that um, will ensure that there's a progression there for all students. Um, inclusion of all, again, it speaks to ensuring that time is protected and we don't um, create more opportunity gaps by separating kids out. And lastly, assessment, using it very wisely um, by, um, by not necessarily just focusing on the gaps, using it to um, be able to see where children need, but to target those needs as they emerge in the instruction. And our data team and our data department has really looked at um, limiting the assessments that students and that students are taking, and we've all and we've aligned them all to the essential standards to ensure that it's all very deliberate. Next slide. Again, some big ideas here for, for addressing pupil learning loss that are included in our plan that I think are key to our efforts to mitigate the learning is there's a huge focus on focusing on acceleration versus remediation. We know that there's no abundance of time um, available to us to really go back and try to fill in all these gaps. Rather, what we need to do is focus on, on strong core uh, tier one instruction where um, we accelerate student learning by accelerating their exposure to core grade level instruction. And that's a, a huge piece. Also, just in time versus just in case learning. I know oftentimes it may feel like, oh, they might have missed this. So just in case I'm going to teach this lesson. Well, there's no time to do that. What we want to do is you want just in time. So as you're um, leading kids through your instruction, you want to address any gaps that come in so they're relevant to the lessons that are taking place and that will ensure that we're truly accelerating the learning for kids. And we've, again, included these in our in our PDs and in our instruction to our leadership and teachers as we go through um, how best to address loss. And lastly, that last box on providing multi-tiered levels of differentiated support. Of course, we know that we have learners at every level and um, we need to, give them not just the core, but also more learning opportunities. Next slide. So here what I provided for you is again, a graphic that just kind of speaks to the multi-tiered systems of support. You probably have seen it on the left where it talks about how you ensure that you provide um, universal supports for all students, additional support for some students and intensified support for a few students. So we really have used this as a framework to, to really um, at, consider and outline what are gonna be those core universal supports additional supports and intensified support. So on the right side, I've listed some of the additional um, programs that we've added to address some of the loss. So again, for the universal supports, 
you have what we're doing, which is during the school day, all children are getting those essential standards. We're, we've made pacing adjustments and they have, there's limited um, assessments that are only directly aligned to the standards. We're also looking at engaging teachers to offer a preview or review of essential standards and that possibly could be on Saturdays. We all know that students benefit from either seeing something prior to it being taught as a flipped learning model um, for our emergent bilinguals, whether it be vocabulary and so forth and or review. But again, we see this as a support to, to, to accelerate learning in the core for all students. Um, um, on the additional support, we've looked at how after that, after the synchronous instructional minutes, how we're using all TOSAs, both TOSA instruction and PD, to provide additional support in the areas of phonics and foundational skills for our early grades and comprehension and fluency in our upper grades. Again, just additional time to support those areas of need. And then finally, so, some support for a few students and intensified support, we've identified um, what we'll be providing as an acceleration academy, two acceleration academies. They'll be taking place at the end of the school day um, to support two areas that we've identified as key areas of, of learning. Of course, our emergent bilinguals and at-risk long-term English learners for grades three through six. And then in math, um, again, targeting an area that we think has enduring math value uh, and progression in operations and algebraic thinking for grades one through six. Next slide. And then lastly, I, I can't go without saying, I think we're all very passionate about our students, our community specifically, and um, the community we served, which is, I know one, uh, you know, what I consider a vulnerable community in many regards, but when we're really talking about addressing pupil learning loss, we need to also consider um, um, how we're providing equity and access to the standards. At the end of the day, this is an issue of equity uh, for many of our students and especially our community to ensuring that they're not just getting that, that strong instruction, but that they're also, again, getting that access to the standards. I wanted to share with you um, a report that I, I just kind of hits to the core of, of what we need to do for kids and families. And it's a recent report by TNTP and it's titled The Opportunity Myth. And it looked at the assignments that students were given and they found that on average, students were spending three quarters of their instructional time off grade level work. Um, and as we know, that directly impacts our most traditionally underserved students. So it's critical that, especially in our current context, that we're very deliberate in, in ensuring that students are receiving that again, grade level core instruction, that they get strong instruction, deep engagement with challenging assignments and that we um, hold high expectations above all. So that's it for, for my part. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Leslie. Um, Thank you very much, I, Maria. All, all right. right. If I may, yes, this, Ryan. Is, this is a really long like presentation. And I know that for myself, like, I, I need to chunk things, otherwise I'm going to forget my questions. Um, That's fine. Go I ahead, really, if, if I mean, it, it, unless it's going to disrupt the flow, I would really like to ask questions after each of the it's, presentations just because it's so specific. No, that's completely fine, uh, Trustee Wallace. I want to cool. honor uh, the help uh, or the assistance with regards to each of our trustees because, uh, yes, with uh, such long presentations, uh, sometimes our questions might get lost. So. Uh, I am in agreement. Uh, so yes, go ahead, trust to us. Cool. Um, I was just curious about the whole issue of, um, you mentioned the, the we're, we're not gonna be doing a lot of assessments, is that correct? We've adapted our assessments and limited. So in some instances, we've gone from seven to four where they're just very, they're directly aligned to the essential standards. Yes. Okay, and I guess that was my question in the sense of like, since it is focusing, as you said, more on depth, um, how are those assessments more or less basically utilized since, you know, it, it, it's going to vary greatly, like from teacher to teacher with their students? 
Yeah, and that's one of the recommendations that it's very important that we take it as a formative assessment. It's a point in time and use use it to guide and direct your instruction, not necessarily be this is the end all marker of where this child is, because we want to support families, especially in how we use assessment. And now that assessment um, in some instances, our families are joining us in some of the assessments and seeing a piece of that through the remote learning. We want we've been messaging, it's it's a tool to support and guide where kids are, meet their learning and move them along. And does that answer your question, Mr. Rellis? Yeah, yeah, no, that 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 does. Okay. Um, and then my second question had to do with a slide that had something in reference to inclusion of all. Yes, yes. <laughs> I wanted to see that one again for a second. Okay, uh, pupil learning loss, uh, grade level content and rigor, focus on depth, prioritize content and learning, inclusion of all and use of assessment. Now, when you say inclusion of all, um, obviously when it comes to the whole issue of like our curriculum specialists and you know our individuals uh, that we have that are specific like for the purposes of addressing student specific student learning, um, we're going to still continue that, right? I mean, it's not just an inclusion of all of like everybody's going to be receiving these great kind of instruction. I mean, we will still continue the whole targeted instruction per se. If, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, will we still do targeted supports for specific Correct. groups? Yeah. What, what I meant to communicate through that bullet point and what with the recommendations and guidance is to ensure that when we are doing our core tier one instruction that we aren't pulling kids out to provide other services that they're all getting that tier one core um, service before we pull them out for targeted services okay thank you for that clarification okay that was my main thing okay awesome thank you yeah All right, board members, any questions for um, Maria at this time? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Leslie Col uh, Coughlin, uh, our Director of Pupil Services, you're up. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, a really important priority for AESD is the mental health and social emotional supports for staff and students so that our staff is able to um, deliver and present the outstanding instruction that both Corey and Maria just explained and so that our students are in a space to be able to receive and benefit from that outstanding instruction. So as such, um, all students will begin each day with social emotional learning lessons as their foundation provided by their classroom teachers. And these lessons include the use of our second step curriculum, which is our social emotional uh, learning uh, guide, calm classroom activities, which are mindfulness based, mm -hmm and um, proactive restorative circles, which include topics such as um, check-ins regarding their emotions, um, topics uh, that will help with relationship building and getting to know one another so that our students have the benefit of feeling connected to school, um, to their peers, to their teachers, and building a sense of community even in this virtual environment. Um, additionally, we have uh, are continuing with our character development weeks each trimester, which um, center on providing lessons to strengthen students' resiliency and build their skills regarding citizenship, responsibility, and respect. Um, and also, during the month of September, all schools are participating in our 21 Days of Kindness Challenge, supported by their Behavior Support Team, or BST. And the BST is supporting teachers in providing three weeks of daily activities centered around showing kindness to others. So in addition to the universal social emotional lessons that I've just described, the BST, which as you'll recall, consists of site administrators, psychologists, counselor, behavior health aide, uh, the school nurse and um, behavior intervention assistant, 
They will provide support for all students um, with things such as classroom guidance lessons, which um, are lessons about things like the zones of regulation, conflict resolution, and so many more lessons that BST members have developed for teacher and counselor use, um, focusing on social emotional skill development, which is so crucial to student success. Um, the BST also uses the um, data from our universal screener, the BESI, uh, to identify students and classrooms that may need additional support. Um, BST members provide support for students who are experiencing difficulty in this distance learning format and assist with push-in support to our virtual classroom settings as well as provide social skill groups for students that um, will benefit from that support in strengthening their social skills. We also have a streamlined referral system through our collaboration with the Western Youth Services um, to ensure that uh, mental health referrals made on behalf of families and students are processed quickly so that they get the help that they need in a timely manner. Um, now on our next slide, you'll see that um, wellness support for our staff is really important, especially during this time. Um, there's a lot to do differently and um, we wanna make sure that our staff is well supported. Um, they have access to many um, resources through uh, the employee assistance program through their employee health benefits. And additionally, we have organized um, in Ed Services the, um, some staff self-care and mental well-being resources, which uh, include things like personal wellness, open-ended groups, which are run by master's level uh, personnel with Western Youth Services. So staff can drop into these group sessions where there's going to be a focus on alleviating anxiety. Um, we have mindfulness and self-compassion exercises and lessons for staff to utilize. Um, recorded art lessons by our wonderful and talented uh, Laura Houston, which help uh, our staff members to experience art and um, benefit from the calming and relaxation um, benefits from doing art. And we have playlists with soothing musical selections on Spotify, um, guided meditation resources, self-care grab-and-go resources. We have some adult resilience modules um, through the Second Step adult resources that we have about personal self-care, caring for one another, and also um, student care. And then also we have some movement and brain break resources for our staff so that they can keep their minds fresh and their stress low um, and they can just be their best for themselves and also for our students and for one another. Um, and these are just some of the ways that we're supporting our staff and encouraging self-care during this um, difficult and unique time. Um, that is the portion about mental health and social emotional support. And if there are no Leslie, questions. Leslie, great, great, great uh, slide. I really love this particular slide. Uh, how many of our staff have utilized this so far? You know, um, they are resources that staff are free to Just use as they wish. Mm -hmm. So okay. the, the groups at this point, we don't have a count, but we certainly can um, gather that information as the groups continue to um, be held. Yes. Thank you, Leslie. Chris, yeah, can we, uh, I'm really curious on how many uh, staff are utilizing this and uh, just, this is so vital right now. Uh, and, and at this time, I want to thank all of our staff. I know that they're working super hard right now. And I know that these things are just so vital right now for any human during this time. Board members, do you have any questions uh, right now for Leslie? Um, I do. Okay. Okay. Uh, and thank you, Maria. Thank you, Leslie, for all the information. Leslie, if you could just help me a little bit with the clarification. I know about the Western Youth Services and the referral services. 
and are working with them. But can you clarify that a little bit? Like what's the protocol or the process when they come into play or what's it look like when they're utilized? Um, you know, what's our interaction? What's that look like? As far as referring a student or family for mental health support resources or yes. for the staff groups? For, for the mental uh, resources, mm -hmm. health resources. Oh, yes. Well, can you, can um, you just clarify that, that picture a little bit for me? Sure, sure. So um, parents or school staff or uh, a collaboration between can um, refer families or um, students for counseling support services, either individual for student or family support group um, services through our Western Youth Services partners. Okay. So a referral is sent to the Western Youth Services um, directly from one of our AESD employees. And we make sure that that um, referral is handled very quickly so that um, counseling sessions can begin as soon as possible for that student and or for that family um, to get the support that they need. Thank you. Sure. Um, Hi. Leslie, I just wanted to uh, comment and it, it's actually, it's crazy because of the fact that the timing is just perfect because um, as you know, I'm a teacher as well. And um, I serve on the CTA State Council as the Chair for Credentialing and Professional Development. And we have just been tasked with the charge of basically uh, working on this group called the Teacher Support Team. And then basically it's in conjunction with the CTA President, Toby Boyd, um, and his participation in the Governor Newsom's uh, task force for um, business and jobs recovery. And what it's dealing with is it's dealing exactly with this, is we're evaluating the different types of um, professional development and professional learning opportunities that are available for teachers. And one of my major critiques has been that, um, and this is with the California Teachers Association, because that was my focus is of the resources available from CTA, is that it's not very well publicized. And um, I've studied these resources pretty thoroughly this past weekend and the last couple days. And what you're talking about and whatnot is is exactly in sync um, with what they've had for the month of September, for example. The month of September is dealing with the social emotional uh, needs of our students and teachers. Um, we're dealing mostly with um, the whole idea of trauma informed approach uh, to learning in a um, in a virtual setting, and um, with the our students that are the aces kind of being the epicenter of this approach. Um, and that was my critique with CTA is why don't you publicize this more to other individuals because there's great um, webinars, there's great um, already PDFs, there's great slide presentations already already there that are created by teachers who are there that are doing this in instruction and in uh, professional development on a regular basis. So um, kudos to your presentation. Um, but I do just want to also put that out there as well, just because of the fact that I would feel like uh, not practicing what I preached in my report that I just gave to CTA uh, if I didn't mention it now, okay? Um, but I will be sure to pass this on to Faith Deverin and other individuals with AEA. But just so you know, um, there's a wealth of knowledge there as well. Thank you. And, you know, I do just want to say that the entire Department of Ed Services greatly appreciates the um, board and cabinet support for um, just really understanding how important social emotional learning and social emotional and um, mental well being supports are for our staff, our students, and our families. So, we greatly appreciate your support and understanding of this foundational piece um, for our school communities. So, thank you very much. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Was that a question? No, I just said absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's just super important and we just cannot, you know, continue on the educational process until the social emotional well-being is taken care of, you know? So thank you guys. Yes, thank you so much. In tune with Maslow, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, all right. So any other questions, board member for uh, Leslie?
All right. So let's go ahead and go with um, Yvette Magana. You're up. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm going to speak with you tonight, kind of what attendance procedures um, and adjustments we've made for providing support and tiered intervention in regards to attendance. And obviously this year in this distance learning format and then later perhaps in our blended learning format, um, attendance is really defined now as pupil engagement and participation. And so we have to really um, consider both when we are determining if a student should be marked present or absent for the day. And so the way we're defining engagement and participation is if a student is engaged, then they are logging on for their live instruction or their synchronous, synchronous instruction from their teacher and interacting with their teacher and their peers through via Microsoft Teams, which is the platform that we're providing our live instruction. Um, and then they are participating if they are completing work assignments via that asynchronous um, assignments that teachers are providing on various online platforms that we have. Um, so teachers, we've utilized um, a teacher tracking tool that they use to document daily if students have logged on for their synchronous instruction and if they have completed their asynchronous assignments. So the tracking log, um, fulfills that requirement that we have for keeping a weekly uh, engagement and participation log. Um, it also includes um, more of a, like a weekly overview of the amount of um, assignments that have been completed by each student. So um, each teacher has their own tracking log. It has their, their class roster on it and they each new week create a new tab that documents the level of engagement for each student each week. Um, and then on Mondays, they use this tracking log to determine if students should be marked present or absent for each day of the previous week. And the reason why we chose um, having teachers take attendance on Mondays is because we really wanted to allow our families and our students the ability to have some flexibility and autonomy with their schedules in regards to completing that asynchronous work. So we know as working parents who are juggling the various challenges of supporting their child's education at home, whether they be essential workers and going out of the home to work or if they're um, needing to work at home while their child is perhaps in the same room or in the next room um, doing their, their distance learning. We wanted to give them the flexibility to support their children in a way that, that really works for them. And so students can complete their asynchronous work all throughout the week and even have the weekend to complete that work um, and submit it to their teachers. And their teachers will review that on Mondays and then consider that when they are marking them absent or present in our student information system. So then those teacher logs um, are reviewed daily by our vice principal led school attendance review teams. So all of our vice principals have developed school attendance review teams that consist of attendance liaisons, office staff, family and community engagement specialists, and some other support staff on site um, to kind of have an all hands on deck approach to providing outreach to our families. And so they all have access to the teacher tracking logs. We're not waiting until um, attendance comes through on our student information system on Mondays to reach out and provide support to students. We are accessing those tracking logs every day um, and not waiting for families to reach out to us for support. We're, we're looking at those logs and identifying students who are not logging on for synchronous instruction right away and we're providing immediate outreach and support to them. Um, and so we are um, using that as kind of our, our first step and our first approach to outreach to to families and students. Um, and then after kind of the first few weeks, once we've provided that universal outreach and support, school sites and school attendance review teams will have a better idea of what students need, which students need a little bit of extra support and provide that tiered support to those students. Um, and we've developed a needs assessment that helps our school attendance review team members. Um, it kind of helps guide their conversations with parents in regards to what 
may be the challenges and barriers to students engaging and participating in their distance learning. And that needs assessment asks um, a myriad of questions ranging from just connectivity issues and technology issues all the way to mental health issues, food insecurity, and unstable housing situations that may, they may be experiencing. Um, and then we've pulled, of course, resources to support families when, when school attendance review team members identify excuse me, identify those challenges or barriers that may be getting in the way of their child and participating on a regular basis. Um, so we really are, are trying to provide a proactive approach to supporting our families. We're not waiting days until, you know, families reach out to us. We're not waiting days of students not logging on for synchronous instruction before we do that outreach and try to identify what's getting in the way. Um, and we've so far noticed a pretty positive attendance rate across the district. Um, on average, we have a 96.26% attendance rate right now. Um, we have some sites with an attendance rate as high as 99%, which is pretty fabulous. Um, we have, I haven't experienced that in the last few years that I've been coordinating attendance here in the district. Um, so that's pretty exciting that we, in some capacity, and in, that is our online, our Anaheim Elementary Online Academy has, an, has a really high attendance rate, which um, is really great and just indicative that we are serving the needs of several of our students and um, that they are still willing and able and and wanting to engage in their education um, despite some of these hiccups that we've had um, with our pandemic. Um, so we're pretty excited and proud of our current attendance rate. Does anybody have any questions? Wow, wonderful. 96.26%. Great job, Yvette. I have questions. Educate. Can I finish? Oh yeah, sure. Sorry. And great and great presentation. All right, let's go ahead and have questions. Trust you, Wallace. Um, my question is, um, when a like I, I see that basically, um, attendance seems like it's almost based off of a student um work submission, student completion as well. Is that correct, Eva? Yes, uh, it's a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. Correct. Do we have a certain threshold that we have to meet in order for us to award credit for students as being present? So a student, a student needs to either log on for synchronous instruction or complete asynchronous uh, work that was assigned that day. And if they only, let's say if they had four assignments and they only completed one of the four assignments, do they get credit for being there that day? They do, yes. Oh, okay, cool. So there's really no kind of like threshold in regards to percentage wise that they have to meet with student work. Not to be con not to be considered present in our student information system. However, if teachers are concerned about their students' level of work completion, so if their students have a low level of work completion, and on those tracking logs, there is weekly they are keeping track of how many assignments students are completing out of how many total are being provided. And if teachers at any point get concerned that their students are having a low level of work completion, and we've kind of held that threshold at 60%, if a student falls below that, um, then that warrants concern and that warrants a referral to your school attendance review team. And then the okay. vice principal kind of leads the team through helping identify what may be the challenges or the barriers that that student may be facing, whether it be academic or social emotional or any other um, barriers that may be getting in the way. And Yvette, is that threshold set by the teacher themselves or is it a universal throughout the district or dictated to us from the California Department of Ed? So the threshold for work completion it was not uh, dictated by the California Department of Ed. Um, they dictated, well, they, they have stated that we are required to um, track weekly students' level of engagement and participation. And should teachers become concerned, we need to provide tiered outreach and support. Um, so we've held the threshold at 60%, but teachers can refer students at any point in time when they become concerned to their school attendance review teams. Awesome, awesome. 
And then the second question I have is, if um, a student submits late work, how does that work in regards to the teachers and their ability to take attendance then? Would students get retroactive attendance credit for being there for any late work submitted? And do teachers have that ability themselves or do they have to go through an attendance clerk or register of some sort to make those modifications? So how we, how we have set up teachers' ability to take attendance in ARIES is that we are allowing them access to the five. Oops. In ARIES. So we take attendance on Mondays. We allow students that whole entire week to turn in work. So they have through the weekend to turn in late work. Of course, a teacher can accept that late work at any time. Um, but in, in order for the student to be marked present, it has to be turned in by Sunday evening so that the teacher can review the work and then takes attendance for the entire previous week on Monday. Um, and then, you know, if the teacher's policy is that she will allow the students to turn in late work, which I'm almost certain most of our teachers will allow that, um, then they can do so. It just, they wouldn't be able to go back and change the absence in ARIES. Okay, so just to clarify, then it's just for they have the ability to change it based on that week that they just completed, but they cannot go, let's say we finish the end of the month and students have turned in work from week one of the month. We cannot right. change that absence. Okay, okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, re really, really great questions, uh, Trustee Rellis. So uh, just to clarify what you just said, uh, Yvette, uh, mm -hmm. so it's up to the teacher if they're going to accept late work. Yeah, and and for elementary school teachers, you know, they they are really the the late work would be to help them assess whether or not they comprehended the lesson and how to help guide the teacher's instruction. So, um, you know, the way we report and kind of grade students is different than the way maybe a middle school or a high school teacher would in the, in that they may not be assigning points to assignments that would count towards a grade. Um, so right now we're using that week to allow students to complete their work in order for it to count towards attendance. Mm -hmm. But if a teacher wanted a student to complete a missing assignment to help them understand the level of engagement and understanding with a specific um, lesson, then of course the teacher has the ability and option to do that. Okay, Trustee Alvarez, uh, before you uh, go, uh, I think uh, Dr. Grace wants to add something. No, I'm good. Okay, okay, go ahead, Juan. Sure, my comment's more of a concern with how cumbersome it might be for a teacher to have to fill out this report. On the previous slides, I have it on my other computer. You have a little screenshot of part of the report. And just in look, there you go. And looking at that alone, it looks like there's a lot of information going in there. And I'm concerned about the amount of time that's adding to a teacher's plate that could be redirected to planning curriculum, planning lessons that are engaging for kids to grading, to doing things that they should be doing and not things that the state thinks that we should be doing. And so uh, could, could we get a copy of what that actually looks like, Dr. Downey? Because I'm a little concerned that we might be overburdening teachers with a lot of reporting that could be maybe lessened and take some, we're talking about social emotional uh, well-being of mm. teachers, right, and teachers. If we keep burdening, burdening them with more and more and more and more and more to do, mm. they can't actually do the job that they're charged to do, which is to educate, right? So yeah. I, I would like for us to take a look at that. Um, I haven't actually seen what those look like exactly besides that screenshot. And maybe if we could have a conversation about whether um, we're, meeting, we're meeting the state requirements. I know it's a state requirement, but yet burdening less on the, taking uh, something off of the teacher's plate if we can. Mm. Yeah, we'll follow up. And Dr. Grace, I think we've already had some conversations with AEA. Would you like to share what has been discussed? Yes, we we ha we are talking through the log. Um, yes, we we ha we are talking through the log. Um, yes, we we ha we are talking through the log. Um, Yes, we, we, we are talking through the log. Uh... <laughs> 
So yes, board member Alvarez, we'll follow up with you and provide the uh, update regarding the requirements for teachers. And um, we're happy to also share what the state is requiring, which is completion of about 20 categories. Um, as a district, we've done our of about 20 process as much as possible. As a district, we have continue to work as much as possible. As a district, we continue to work as much as possible. Okay. So, Dr. Grace, why don't you mute? We'll get that data. So, Dr. Grace, why don't you mute? Yeah, hold I like this echo. This is awesome. Sorry. I like this echo. All right. Thank you. So we'll provide that information and we'll continue to engage with our teachers. We value okay. time and, and want to do our best to continue to we have one last slide. Mm. Can you hear me? Okay. Hear so the last slide we have has to do with school nutrition. And um, we are fortunate through partnering with our uh, food service provider, the Anaheim Union High School District, that we have um, two types of grab and go service right now. Students and families can go to their nearest elementary, junior high or high school daily to pick up breakfast and lunch and or starting last week we have about eight bus stop locations throughout the city that our families can go and they can pick up five days worth of meals so that they have them at home they don't have to worry about going out to get them and um, it's been very helpful that the um, high school district has been responsive to listening to the neighborhood feedback that we've been getting and they are able to adjust and pivot and provide services within the neighborhoods as needed. All right. So what? before we end, I would just like to reiterate um, this plan has been being put together uh, even prior to receiving the regulations and um, sections needed, prior to the state coming out with their guidance. Uh, we began this work back on May 19th with our school reopening committee, and we have had multiple stakeholder input sessions, and we will continue. We have two more after this to make sure that we've you know, addressed all of the needs and our whole community is comfortable with the plan that we are will submit to you on September 23rd for your approval. I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Downing until I can figure out how I can hear. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Greg, she did a great job of summarizing. Board members, are there any additional questions regarding any part of tonight's presentation? We think it was very comprehensive and hopefully gave you uh, a better understanding and to you and to our community uh, regarding our continuity of learning plan. No questions, just a comment, Dr. Downing, in the sense that like, obviously in these unprecedented times, this is craziness and uh, lots of different things taking place. But I just wanna say that I'm very proud of all the work um, AESD is doing um, to make this transition, of course, this reality now of distance learning um, as easy as possible for our students and families. And yes, there's a lot of still hiccups and yes, there's still a lot of things that we need to still figure out. But um, the thing to remember is that we're doing the best that we can and I'm just really thankful for all of that. So kudos to everyone tonight for your presentations, very thorough um, and very informative. Um, thank you all. Thank All right, you. board members, uh, Trustee Philbeck. I just wanted to say, also mention that um, not just tonight, but in ever many other board meetings, 
the presentations that you put together, the slides and such, you know, are really attractive. They're very pleasant. Um, you know, they're very informative. They're easy to read. The color is great. So for putting those together, I know that that takes a lot of work to put those presentations together. And um, so and, and I think we should be proud of the people that are doing that because it's they're doing a great job with those presentations. And they, they are very, very uh, good presentations and attractive. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of our entire team. All right, Trustee Alvarez or Trustee Lopez, do you have any questions or comments at this time? All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for such an amazing presentation, but most importantly, the work. And I know y'all have been working extremely hard, sometimes over hours, and especially during these difficult times and also having to worry about your families at the same time. So I am 110% extremely grateful for all of your hard work. Uh, during this time. So know that everyone and everyone especially who presented this evening. I hope you all uh, sleep well and uh, uh, let's go ahead and continue on with our presentation uh, with our uh, board meeting. Um, all right, let's move on to item D. It is recommended the Board of Education declare a public hearing for the purpose of reviewing the proposed learning continuity and attendance plan for the 2020-2021 school year within the Anaheim Elementary School District in accordance with the provisions of Ed Code Section 43509. The learning continuity and attendance plan are on file and available for public review at the Anaheim Elementary School District Office of Educational Services. Written comments up to 500 words may be submitted via uh, this form and must be received by 12 p.m. on Wednesday, September 9th, 2020. Uh, comments submitted will be read aloud by the board president or designee. After hearing comments from the public, the board president will give notice that a vote on this item is scheduled for September 23, 2020 in the regular board meeting. All right. Um, and we do not have any comments for this evening. That's correct. So let's go ahead and move on to the consent calendar. Items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are acted on by the board in one motion. There is no discussion of these items unless a member of the board, staff, or public requests specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar. So, at this time, board members, do you have anything to pull? Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, can I get a motion? So moved, Rellis. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Second. Get a second. Lopez. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Discussion. Hearing none, roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I vote aye. Passes 5 0. Moving on to action calendar. Uh, superintendent's office. It is request, requested that the Board of Education consider nominating board members from the California School Boards Association member district or county office of education to serve as director at large, uh, either the Asian Pacific Islander or the Hispanic uh, particular groups. Can I get a motion? So, so moved. Uh, Second by Trustee Ruelas. Can Second, I get a second? Philbeck. Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Trustee Philbeck. Uh, discussion. Now, uh, first of all, whenever we have these, uh, can we just ask, is anyone even interested in it? Or do we just have to nominate right away? You ask if we're interested. I don't think any of us, uh, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not interested. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, if you're interested, I'll nominate you. You know what I mean? Anyone? No, I think it's up to our board discretion, Dr. Magalas. Okay. So. I don't know who would be interested. Okay. I mean, maybe in the future I'd be interested, but just not at this time. We're all so bombarded with so much work right now. <laughs> I know. Like, that's the last thing I want to do is have something else on my plate, you know? Thank you. All right. So anything yeah, else? I think we can, we can decide that. And I'm already on the, yeah. as a delegate. So <laughs> let me tell you, there's a ton of work with that too. So, yeah. All right. So okay. I guess we're not nominating anyone. So do we still vote? 
vote that we're not nominating people? No, a vote is unnecessary. A vote is unnecessary, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Moving on to two. It is recommended the Board of Education approve the appointment of employee number 09092020-01 to the position of Acting Assistant Superintendent Administrative Services effective September 10, 2020 until a full-time Assistant Superintendent is hired. So moved, Rollis. I got a motion. Moved by Trustee Second, Rollis. Rollis. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Discussion. All right. Hearing none. Roll call vote. Trustee Wellis. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Um, for this, Chris, does uh, Dina have to announce? Yeah. All right. Dina. Yes. She's ready. Okay. Thank you. Beginning tomorrow, September 10th, Jesse Chavaria will serve as the Acting Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services. Jesse has worked in AESD since 1999 and currently serves as the Director of Transportation. Other positions Jesse has held in this district include Principal, Vice Principal, Teacher on Special Assignment, and Classroom Teacher. Congratulations to Jesse Chavaria. All right, congratulations. Um, okay, just give me one second, 9A4. Okay, let's move on to three. It is recommended the Board of Education adopt emergency resolution 2020-21 slash 09, delegating the superintendent authority to take appropriate action to protect students and staff from the spread of coronavirus during the 2020-2021 school year. Can I get a motion? So second, Ruelas. Trustee Alvarez, seconded by Trustee Ruelas. Uh, discussion. Hearing none, roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. <clears throat> Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Uh, Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. All right. Moving on to four, it is recommended the Board of Education approve the employment agreement of Dr. Mary Grace O'Neill, Assistant Superintendent of Ed Services, effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30, 2023. And hold on before we motion, uh, Dr. Downing, you have something yeah. to say? Thank you. The board will be considering an employment contract renewal for Dr. Mary Grace, Assistant Superintendent Educational Services, effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. The recommended compensation is summarized as follows. Annual base salary of $196,091. Any base salary increases or decreases given to the other certificated unit members. Contributions to health benefit programs as is paid for other certificated management employees in the same program. Holidays as defined in the education code or granted by the board. Sick leave to the same extent as other certificated management employees. 22 days of non-paid vacation leave annually. Reimbursement for all actual and necessary travel and other business related expenses incurred in the conduct of her duties and dues for annual membership and professional organization and or association. All right, can I get a motion? So move, Philbeck. Second. So moved by Ruelas. Trustee Philbeck, seconded by Trustee Ruelas. Discussion. Hearing none, roll call vote. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Were you going to say something? No. Okay. Uh, thank you, Trustee Ruelas. He says aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. I think he was frozen. Ah, okay. Sorry, Trustee Lopez. I think you're frozen. Now he's on mute. I was really excited to vote. That's why I just unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> Is that no an discussion. I, Trustee Lopez? Yes, that's an I. Ah, okay. Wonderful. Uh, board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. 
passes five zero. Moving on to five, it is recommended the Board of Education approve the employment agreement of Dina Milan, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30, 2023. Dr. Downing. The board will be considering an employment contract renewal for Dina Mellon, Assistant Superintendent Human Resources, effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. The recommended compensation is summarized as follows. Annual base salary of $196,091. Any base salary increases or decreases given to other certificated unit members. Contributions to health benefit programs as is paid for other certificated management employees in the same program. Holidays as defined in the education code or granted by the board. Sick leave to the same extent as other certificated management employees. 22 days of non-paid vacation leave annually. Reimbursement for all actual and necessary travel and other business related expenses incurred in the conduct of her duties and dues for annual membership and professional organization and or associations. All right, with that said, can I get a motion? I moved Alvarez. So moved by Trustee Alvarez, can I get a second? Second, Phil Beck. All right, discussion. Hearing none, roll call vote, Trustee Ruelas. Trust Sorry, you. technical difficulties. I couldn't uh, find the way to unmute myself. <laughs> I, of course, I. Yes. Trusty Philbeck. Aye. Trusty Lopez. I will vote aye, and I apologize to Dina and Mary Grace for the technical difficulties right at this inopportune moment during the meeting. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. All right. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to B, Ed Services. It is recommended the Board of Education adopt resolution number 202020-21-06 in support of mental health awareness throughout the Anaheim Elementary School District. Can I get a motion? So move, Rellis. So moved by Trustee Wellis. Can I get a second? Second, Lopez. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Discussion. Hearing none, roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas? Aye. Trustee Philbeck? Aye. Trustee Lopez? Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez? Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. Moving on to SELPA, there is none. D, Human Resources. It is recommended the Board of Education approve an agreement between this district and Cintas First Aid and Safety at 4320 East Mariloma Avenue, Anaheim, California, 92807, to provide CPR and AED training to district employees. The fee for this service shall not exceed $9,000. Can I get a motion? I move, Rollis. Second, Can Philbeck. I get a second. Thank you, Trustee Philbeck. Discussion. Hearing none, roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas? Aye. Trustee Philbeck? Aye. Uh, Trustee Lopez? Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez? Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. All right, moving on to two. It is recommended the Board of Education approve the new job description and recruitment for cybersecurity specialists. This position shall be on range seven of the classified management salary schedule. Can I get a motion? So move. So move. All right. You can give it to Mark. All right. Uh, Alvarez. Moved by uh, Trustee Lopez, seconded by Trustee Alvarez. Discussion. Hearing none, roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. It is recommended the Board of Ed approve the new job description for Senior Director of School Safety and Operations. 
This position will be placed on the range 17 of the cert certified certificated credentialed salary schedule based on 220 uh 220 days. Can I get a motion? So moved Alvarez. Moved by Trustee Alvarez. Can I get a second? Second, Rellis. Seconded by Trustee Ruelas. Discussion. Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. Moving on to four. It is recommended the Board of Education approve the appointment of employee number 09092020. Dash zero two to the position of senior director of school safety and operations effective September 10, 2020. Can I get a motion? So moved, Rellis. So moved by Trustee Wells. Can I get a second? Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Trustee Philbeck. Discussion. All right, let's go ahead and vote. Trustee Wells. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Trustee Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Dina. Beginning tomorrow, September 10th, Tracy Golden will begin serving as the Senior Director of School Safety and Operations. Tracy has worked in AESD since 1999 and currently serves as both the district's COVID coordinator and Director of Risk Management. Other positions Tracy has held include principal, vice principal, leadership assistant, teacher on special assignment, and classroom teacher. Congratulations to Tracy Golden. Wonderful. Congratulations, Tracy Golden. Moving on to E, administrative services. It is recommended the Board of Ed approve resolution number 2020-21-07, establishing a final GAN limit for the 2019-2020 and a preliminary GAN limit for 2020-2021 as required by law. Appropriations subject to the limit for 2019-2020 are $122,751,655. Moved by Trustee Ruelas. And the preliminary limit for 2020-2021 is $127,330,000. $1,277.84. The district's final appropriations for 2019 2020 and the preliminary for 2020 2021 are well within limits and comply with all requirements. Can I get a motion? So move, Rellis. So moved by Trustee Rellis. Can I get a second? Second, Lopez. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Uh, discussion. Yes. Can you please remind us what a GAN limit is again? Yes. And Jesse Chavaria is going to give that explanation. Yeah. The, the GAN limit is something that we do every year. It, it was established in 1979 and it was intended to constrain the growth in state and local government spending by linking year to year changes in expenditures. So based on what we spent last year, we just add whatever is in terms of inflation for the coming for this current year. And we're well within the limits because the limits have the the growth has the growth of the limit has grown so significantly that that we're way below, I mean above we're way below where we need to be. In terms of the limit, we won't even get close to it in terms of our expenditures. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jesse. All right. Uh, anything else to discuss? Any other questions, board members? No? All right. Roll call vote. Trustee Rollis. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Uh, Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to 2. E2, it is recommended the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2020-21-08, delegating authority to take necessary action to protect students and staff from the spread of COVID-19. Can I get a motion? 
So moved, Rellis. So moved by Trusted Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Trusty Philbeck. Discussion. <coughs> Hearing none, we'll call vote. Trusty Ruelas. Aye. Trusty Philbeck. Aye. Trusty Lopez. Aye. Trusty Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes. 5-0. All right, moving on to 10. Board discussion. Board member activities related to school business. Trustee uh, Rellis, you're up. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I'm excited because of the fact that in addition to participating in some of the cool um, community events um, that we've been partnering up with, with our parents from PLI here in AESD, um, which we distributed uh, hundreds upon hundreds of great fresh produce to the community. Many of our families in AESD uh, were recipients of that. Um, I was very thankful that I was able to uh, go out last week for a couple days and go um, visit the principals from the five elementary school districts that are in my specific district, uh, District 5. Um, on one day, uh, I went and, um, visited on September 2nd, uh, the principals from Juarez, um, uh, Gwen and Sunkis. Um, so it was great, uh, hanging out with Miss Roman, Dr. Perez and Miss Shoemate. Um, obviously, uh, Miss Roman and Dr. Perez are veteran administrators. Uh, their schools are doing great. Uh, lots of great things, positive things taking place. Um, some things that really resonated with me, which really, um, you know, they're not too hard to replicate at other school sites, but it's one of these things that I see as I drive down Sunkiss every day, uh, whenever I go on the freeway, I see the school sites. It's just like these banners and posters of positive mm -hmm. quotes, positive inspirational, um, messages for our families and our community members. And yes. You know, they're posted throughout the school, and I, I just really appreciate that, and I think it's awesome. Um, both schools are off to a great start, and I'm very excited about that, um, and I'm excited about that energy there. Um, but my day uh, of visits to principals um, from my school site was really highlighted when I went to Sunkiss to go visit um, the new principal there, Ms. Shoemate, who is amazing and i'm so excited for her and her team her assistant principal he also is fantastic um obviously you know that sunkiss is a very very special school we have it being built it's almost going to be brand new it's almost unrecognizable um from what i see when i'm driving down sunkiss um every day or going on my way to church um but it's it's super exciting to just see it and we need great administrators there who are going to be positive and upbeat and really energetic and enthusiastic and go out into that community and really recruit our students um, to come to AESD or come back to AESD. Um, I don't know if um, my other board members are aware of this, but it's a fascinating area where the boundaries are cut because you go right across La Palma and you're in Placentia Yorba Linda School District. You go right across Rio Vista and you're in Placentia Yorba Linda School District. And it's it's mind boggling to me considering we're it's the same zip code and everything. Um, so anyway, it, 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 I'm just very excited about my meetings with those three principals on the second, and um, I'm really thrilled about my meetings with Miss um, Nichols from Edison as well as Miss Chacon from um, Lincoln. Miss um, Chacon is it's her first year there. Um, I always tease Miss. Uh, uh, um, uh, the principal from Edison in the sense, Miss Nichols, because of the fact that her first year we started the pandemic. Um, so what a way to start her year as a principalship, you know, but positive attitude. Those of you that know Miss Nichols, super positive, just really high energy. And I love it. So um, I'm just very excited about that. So um, with those visits to the five principals um, in my specific area, um, as well as the community service project with our PLI parents, um, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Trustee Ruelas, and great work. Moving on to Trustee Philbeck. Thank you. Well, I've been hitting the webinars pretty hard, but I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. Um, I was invited by Wendy Dolan, who 
works uh, with us at our district um, over at Family Oasis and uh, is also with Network Anaheim. And she invited me in uh, on a webinar for general wellness for families in Anaheim. And the discussion centered around planning parent engagement in a pandemic, the purpose, processing, and outcome, and also how to administer, <clears throat> excuse me, service to families. Because when we first went into shelter in place mode, questions on what was needed were asked, but there wasn't any tracking. And now there is. There's a survey questionnaire on dashboard for live data and a wellness tracker to show how the families are, families are doing. And just some of the results of that survey, number one, a concern was elders living in mm. the home. And number two was food. Number three was cleaning supplies. So I'd like to thank Wendy for that invita invitation to be uh, a part of that. It was really informative. And also, since the elders living in the home came up on this survey as, as um, very, you know, concerning, um, that I just wanted to mention, too, that there is at the downtown community center, um, every Thursday from 11 to 1, a senior, and I think you have to be 60, I'm not sure, um, you can go there and get a week's worth of food. So for any of our families, you know, so many of them have grandparents and such living. I've been delivering food for two months to a couple of seniors. And it's easy to sign up. And they, uh, it's a great program. So I just wanted to throw that out there if anybody is concerned. Um, also about their elderly, that there's that to take advantage of senior program. Also, um, I had just a really informative webinar uh, from Children's Hospital, and it was COVID-19 and the flu. And so just to kind of tag on to some of what um, Dr. Downing was saying, you know, the numbers are higher, we're not out of it yet, and it's What's up ahead is going to be difficult to predict because the last flu year was very high numbers and wide. The COVID and the influenza converge. When they converge, they're going to overlap in symptoms and the symptoms are similar. So it's going to be difficult. And so they're working on some protocols to maybe even have, um, you know, virus checks. But again, you know, it's, um, they're calling it the twin demic. That's what I was mm -hmm. told today is it was listed as the twin demic. So I know we have to be really, really diligent about coming into these next months because we're not completely through this yet. And the number one thing that we can do, and I'm not sure if we can put some information as we get it for some of these is to remind people the number one thing is flu vaccine. That's what is being recommended to all of us, that and to continue to mask and um, social distance. And it literally could avert hundreds of thousands of, of deaths. So um, with that being said, there was one other, excuse me, just a minute. The one thing that stuck out too was one of the most highest risk factors for children when we are discussing because there was approximately a thousand children that Chalk has treated, mostly outpatient centers, but 119 have been admitted, a third of those in ICU, two thirds to the regular floor. One of the highest risk factors is obesity, severe obesity. It contributes highly to whether a child is going to have a worse case or not. And that really kind of hit me. So <clears throat> along with that, I was, you know, thinking that, and I don't know, I looked on our webpage, uh, our website, I didn't see any, you know, maybe in the future, I know everybody's overwhelmed right now, but I know my granddaughter loves to look at even the simplest little exercise, um, routine things, you know, that she likes to dance along. And maybe at some point as we, if we continue the distance learning, we can post some fun things on the webpage on the YouTube that the kids can enjoy that involves movement and music and maybe just, you know, kind of having some fun movement. So I thought maybe we can look into something like that. And with that, that concludes uh, my report.
thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Trustee Philbeck. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, let's move on to Trustee Lopez. All right, thank you, Dr. Magalis. And as is usually the case after Ms. Philbeck's report, I feel like such a slacker again, uh, just because I've been uh, pretty busy at work. Uh, the only main event that I have to report um, having attended uh, was our uh, LCAP meeting that we had on August 26th. Um, and even then it was a brief uh, uh, participation that I had because I had to run off to another meeting. So it was just a series of meetings, but I was, I was glad to be able at least to participate uh, at the introduction stage of the meeting. And uh, it looked like there was a, quite a, a few participants there. So I'm glad that uh, everybody's still engaged. There are a lot of parents, a lot of staff. So really appreciate that uh, people are still getting engaged and involved in all the different things that we have. So. I promise my next meeting, I will have more to report. So hopefully things clear up a little bit. So thank you. Thank you so much, Trustee Lopez. Board Clerk Alvarez. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, so I wanna report a little bit about the, the back to school nights. Uh, they, were, they were virtual this year. Uh, I attended my um, second back to school night at Horace Mann Elementary. My son Reese is in uh, kindergarten right now. Uh, it was a little different, especially for parents who are used to back to school night being kind of like a, an event, right, that you go to and you it's like an experience. Um, and once you're a parent, you realize like how cool and important it is to you and that you want you want to have that experience with every child um, and at every grade. Uh, so uh, I want to commend everybody who put a lot of effort and heart into the presentations that were created um, virtually. Knowing uh, I did some research because I'm also teaching online and creating different documents. The documents that were created in Google Slides, those were very cumbersome to put together and they link in a specific way. I get it. So uh, thank you to everybody who put together those those presentations in the slides. Uh, they're really easy to follow and I know that took a lot of time to put together, like a lot. <laughs> so I really appreciate everybody, uh, although we couldn't meet in person. We got to meet uh, the teachers virtually, uh, the teachers, uh, most of the schools had uh, kind of like a summary of the teachers uh, on each of the pages. They went through all of the different staff members who are on campus to support families. Uh, so we made, we made the best of it. So uh, thank you for everyone involved in making that virtual experience, at least be an experience of some sort, right? Um, and investing their time. I also am the proud PTA member of uh, every school in my area and my son's school so i did that <laughs> all i did was click and pay money but it, it's good investment right <laughs> so i'm a pta member at man at henry Gower, uh, loera and marshall and also my own older son's school at the high school district um i think it's really important for us to keep supporting uh, that parent group and making sure that the, they feel like they're supported by us and the best way we can support them is by joining their their groups and their and getting their membership um also, uh, uh, I've been experiencing distance learning as a dad from a distance. My wife's been the, the majority uh, leader in uh, kind of getting my kindergartner through the experience of having to be online all day uh, because I'm, on, on, I'm online all day with other people's kids, right? So uh, I feel bad. Uh, she's super stressed out every single day. Um, there's something that goes on that you can't predict every day. Uh, nothing that we have any control of, like I said earlier in the presentation that we had. Um, so I, I, I feel for the parents who, who, who are not as tech savvy as her, right? She goes through a series of trying to connect or disconnect from our personal email to hotspots, to phone, wi Wi-Fi, back to um, the regular line, back to hotspots, trying to get the uh, kindergartner to meet with his teacher. And the teacher is super understanding, and I'm sure they're also kind of stressed out and experiencing similar things on their end. So everyone understands where we're coming through, but I think we can do more in supporting our families. Um, I'm glad we're going to put out a survey like uh, Trustee Philbeck recommended last uh, meeting to get a kind of like a feel for where everybody's at, because I think it's important for us as parents also to feel like somebody's listening to us, right? Like uh, I feel like we need to have some feedback on that survey. Um, just so we can say, hey, uh, my kindergartner can't be online past lunch because it just falls apart. And after lunch, I'm cool with doing some, I don't know, sounds and letters and counting, but maybe on a piece of paper instead of on a computer, things like that, right? Because we, I, I think 
yeah, we have to create these reports to this day about how we're holding ourselves accountable to educating, but we also have to take a step back again about being human beings, right? And everyone's stressed out and uh, every family's dynamic is different. So I can only report on what I'm experiencing with uh, my wife going through a kindergartner's class. And we've, we've just like sent our seventh grader out to do it himself, right? So we don't even know what his experience is that well either because now, the two of us are elsewhere tending to other children or a fi five-year-old, right? So I could only imagine a household that, that has three elementary age kids and some high school students, and they don't have their own personal internet to uh, bounce off of, and they're relying on hotspots, right? And the parent works, so maybe the older siblings having to manage their younger siblings. I couldn't. I would. I would literally pull my hair out if I had to take care of my younger sibling on distance learning. Right. So I think. Um, you know, my. I think my. To sum it up, basically, I think we just need to remember like the human experience, and take a step back sometimes and be like, yeah, we have to submit these things because we have to check boxes that we're providing services to families, but then we also just have to think, like, what are they going through as a family? And just be like, okay, well, maybe they didn't log on today because the parent just like, I'm not doing this, right? Like, I could feel like like tomorrow I'm just not gonna log on because you know why? I just need to not experience this again, and I need a day off, right? So there's things like that happening, and we just need to be patient with families and just send out love and patience to them, and just how we have to kind of be patient with one another and just let it let kind of run its course. But we'll get through it. I'm very confident and I'm very confident in the team we have here at Arnhem Elementary. We're getting things done and we're helping uh, our families out and that's what we should be doing and we are. So I'm really uh, proud to be part of this uh, team. That's my report. All right, thank you, Board Clerk Alvarez and thank you everyone for your reports as well. Oh, amazing. Um, I also do know that, and I just saw on Facebook that it, there is an AESD virtual parent tutorial on uh, September 10th, right? So uh, very excited for that. Uh, I do know that that has been a big ask for a lot of our families uh, with assistance with regards to distance learning. Uh, so I'm grateful that we're already ahead of the curve on that area. So grateful to the entire staff and cabinet with regards to everything they've been doing. Uh, I want to echo with uh, with regards to what Trustee Ruelas was saying with regards to the banners. I too have been um, around my trustee area a lot. I can't share how and why, but uh, know that uh, every single, I'm, I'm lucky too because three of our marquees at Stoddard, Clara Barton, and Madison, they're first of all, they look great, but the messaging on those, man, they're just beautiful. They, I mean, even when I'm just driving from my car and passing them by, they're just uh, words of inspiration and, and love to our communities during this time. So kudos, great job uh, on that area. So uh, that's all I have to report. Uh, so uh, we do have future agenda items, but one also very important thing before we adjourn, but uh, board members, do we have any future agenda items to uh, report at this time? I would like to put one forward. Okay, uh, Trustee Philbeck. Yeah, it just, um, it, as easy as possible. Um, I should have mentioned also, and thank you to Trustee Alvarez, because he's the one that reminded me to start joining the PTAs and sent me a link. And boy, it was super easy. I joined like five in 15 minutes. So um, that reminds me of PTA because, you know, normally I'm going to all those meetings as a representative and I miss getting the reports of it's kind of hard to know how exactly that's running right now or what's working mm -hmm. or how how are, how are our memberships looking mm -hmm. and um, what are we going to do about you know, the art contests or things that are coming up or some of the things that happen. PTA is super, super busy. So I just wondered if maybe we could, I know there's a meeting, a virtual meeting, um, Monday, September 14th. However, I'm not sure. Is that just for council? Is that, does anybody know? Is that just council? Yeah. That's the regular meeting that you generally that, attend. That I generally attend. Okay. So if maybe it would be helpful just once in a while to kind of, report back on that or if somebody doesn't want to come on um, virtually and give the report just a written to show us kind of how the schools are doing uh, 
with this new normal that we have and the COVID, how, you know, how are the memberships looking and where maybe they're looking for more assistance or I'd, I'd be really interested in kind of getting some more information. I miss the PTA reports. I really do. So, yeah. and I miss being there. I agree on that one. Trust you. Anything else board members before we do one last thing, uh, Trustee Alvarez, do you have anything to add for the future agenda items? All right, everyone, please unmute your microphones because, and thank you, Trustee Philbeck, for spending this, this night on your birthday with us and the community and YouTube on this special day. So let us sing together. Happy birthday to Trustee Philbeck. Ready? One, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Come on, guys. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to say, I, I know there was heart behind that, but everybody needs an energy drink or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. And I know there's some kind thoughts behind that. So thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So, uh, blame it on the Wi-Fi. Okay. Yeah, but I'm blaming on, <laughs> everybody blame it on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, this was an interesting evening. I'm kind of glad I wasn't the only one that had the problems. But We're just honored <laughs> that you're spending your 25th birthday in our presence. So exactly. thank you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Trustee Rellis, for that. So true, too. So totally true. <laughs> all right. Happy birthday. And everyone thank out you. there, please be safe. God bless you all. And thank you for being patient through all the technical difficulties during board meeting. I adjourn this meeting at 8.56 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night, everyone. everybody. Bye, everyone. ASD rocks. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thank you.